Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to the world's principal leaders, sponsored by the Stephen R. Covey Leadership Center in the Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. I'm Professor Boyd Craig, so happy to be here with you today. I'm joined with my co-professor, Lord Michael Hastings, a member of the House of Lords in the British Parliament. So glad that he's joining us today from the UK. And we're thrilled to have with us today as our special guest, Ward Clapham. I'd like to read a very brief intro on Ward for just a couple of minutes. So you get a sense of really the significance of his accomplishment in as a policing leader. At the age of 42, Ward Clapham became the commander of the Richmond, British Columbia, Royal Canadian Mounted Police Detachment. At that time, Ward was the most junior superintendent to ever lead one of Canada's largest detachments. Ward was brought into the Richmond to move the detachment towards a new direction and break old mindsets to achieve extraordinary performance. Ward also had to win back the support of the city of Richmond, who at the time was exploring the possibility of terminating their policing contract with the RCMP and creating their own city police force. Arguably, Richmond was seen as the most challenging detachment in the entire RCMP, and few people thought that Ward could ever improve it. During Ward's first days at Richmond, he saw employee morale at an all-time low. He found a culture of rigid obedience and antiquated policies. And this is when he quickly decided that the command and control leadership model in place had to be changed. Here are some of the significant accomplishments of Ward during his term of service. 53 countries from around the world have studied the Richmond RCMP approach to leadership and problem solving. Youth crime was reduced by almost 50%. They did this by giving out 40,000 positive tickets to youth in their community every year at a ratio of three to one over the traditional negative police ticket, taking up to 500 youth a year to professional hockey or football games through a one-on-one -on -one mentoring initiative called Onside Program reducing the recidivism rate, in other words, repeat offending down to 5% through the Richmond Restorative Justice Program. In other words, they had a 95% success rate and it only cost the taxpayer one-tenth the amount when compared to traditional justice system. They also ended street racing related deaths that once plagued their city on an average of four fatalities a year it's been almost 10 years now at that time since a single death. They enjoyed police officer promotion rates that doubled the RCMP national average. They boasted the highest employee morale and engagement rate in all the RCMP. And the Auditor General of Canada found the Richmond RCMP had the highest client satisfaction rate out of all detachments of Canada. Well, the list goes on. But let me just say that Ward is truly one of the great principal leaders of our time. And in an area where there's enormous pressure, the context of policing in the United States, in the UK, around the world is under enormous stress and pressure with the defunding the police movements with enormous strife and anger and hatred it's all bullseye right in the policing organizations. And so Ward, it's of particular interest to all of us to have you with us today because you present a hopeful model. And we have just 25 minutes or so to unpack that with you. It's not nearly enough time. But we're very honored to have you with us. And we're eager to have you perhaps just begin by sharing the context of what it was like to come right into the fire of a new situation and really what you could do immediately to start getting wins in a very troubled situation. Welcome, Ward. Well, good morning. I hope uh, the sound check is fine. You can hear me okay? Sounds great. great. Uh, yeah, good morning from Nanaimo, British Columbia on Vancouver Island. 
And uh, yeah, let's just jump right into it. And uh, so I joined uh, the RCMP um, looking for a, a career where I could make a positive difference, uh, excitement, uh, see the country, because that's what they do in the Mounties. They move you all around. And, um, and uh, just one quick story, because it really paints the picture for what happened later on in my career. Uh, one of my first uh, Northern Canadian um, detachments, postings, uh, talking to young children about what a police officer does. And it was in a First Nations community. They called me the hunter. And I said, well, I don't, I couldn't shoot an animal even if I wanted to. And they said, no, 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 no. You take our mummy and daddy's away to jail. You wait in the bushes, you hunt, you wait till we do something bad. Then you jump out and arrest us. And that stuck with me as a very young constable. I thought, oh my gosh, mm. no, no. What's wrong here? Fast forward, I go to the Richmond detachment, uh, as you've already heard, and uh, we're facing a number of challenges, but we're in a traditional 911 response uh, orientated reactive environment, and we're designed, we're, we're built around that whole, uh, if I could call it, uh, response uh, type of model. Uh, the hunter, just waiting to be called or out there hunting for, for the bad and the negative. And, uh, and as you heard, they, we, we, it couldn't get any worse as far as I was concerned and what was wrong with uh, moving forward. Now um, that's where we started a, an amazing journey of an inside out approach first, before we were able to start to roll out the successes that you heard about. Tremendous. And as you first got into your situation ward and first got to know your officers and yet felt all of these high expectations that were set for change and turnaround, you know, it's, it's an, there's enormous pressure. You almost don't know where to begin. And I wonder what did you find ward that were the keys for the places to start in this longer term inside out intention that you had? Sure. Well, any leader, um, he or she, the first thing is, is to uh, get some duct tape, or now it's called Gorilla Tape, put it over your mouth after you ask the, the right questions and just listen and try to f understand. And, you know, let, I jokingly said I'm not allowed to have an opinion for 100 days. Mm -hmm. But during that walkabout, uh, if I could call it that, or management by walking around or leadership by walking around, you obviously pick up on some some quick hits that are necessary and, and must be put into play to start uh, the change and or to, to take action on, on things that just can't, you just can't continue to, to meet and discuss and have dialogue over. There's things that just had to be done. So we, first thing I was able to do is move on some quick hits, some, some operational, I won't bore you with it, issues where we were able to change our approach to dealing with some of the crime problems and some of the, the I'll just call it the uh, quadrant one urgent issues. So that that's really key for leadership. And I think you don't want to go in there as a new broom, but at the same time, they're watching and waiting for leaders to take action where, where everybody basically lands and agrees that something needs to be done. And they're looking just for that new, that person to, 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 to start the momentum. Hmm. Tremendous. You know, Ward, I've also heard you talk about the significance of a practice that you engaged in very early on in your morning engagement with your whole team. Would you talk about what you did and why you did it that way? Sure, the, the talking stick, the magic theater as Stephen R. Covey called it, the daily as we called it, where uh, we met every morning, the leadership team. Now that team embodied right from the constable up to the superintendent. And every morning we would, uh, including civilian employees, uh, a good cross representation. We would triage the last 24 hours of, of business, right? And you can do this in any business, doesn't have to be in policing. We first moved to operations triage, and then we'd talk about the larger, because we had a strategic plan and strategic imperatives, and how are we delivering on these imperatives? And uh, what were the, my job was to remove the obstacles and the barriers. So my employees that were being paid and wanted to be motivated by being able to complete what they uh, were hired and being paid to do. My job was to remove those barriers and obstacles. And I couldn't know about it until we could have those discussions. But the synergy came in that lots of the other team uh, players st stood up to the plate to help 
also solve those problems and come up with solutions. And we would br brainstorm all kinds of different solutions. And there were some crazy ones, you got to know, but they were springboards to actually come to some realities of things we were able to do. Hmm. Tremendous. You know, I've also heard you talk about how right up front with the leaders you reported to, you said you needed a year to really start to turn around this culture, which you described as command and control, compliance. Why did you need a year? And what did you do during that year to start to create that deeper change? Sure. So when I joined the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, we all went to one training academy. It's called Depo. And Basically, mostly we were trained as law enforcement officers and we were trained that really the only tool in our toolkit was, was, was the law, was the, you know, the rule book. And don't get me wrong, that's critically important even today in today's modern policing. But that was the primary. And I was in the community and society was changing where they were asking for more than just that one tool, the, the tool um, uh, box, if I could call it. And my officers, my civilian staff, a lot of the community, they were, they only knew the one way. So I needed to make that fundamental change in the mindset before I could move to skill set and tool set changes. Thus, that's where I introduced the seven habits of highly effective people training, not only to all my officers and volunteers and civilian staff, but also to the city, our partner, the city that was paying the bill, we brought them into the training. So we all had a common basic platform launching pad and it was going to take time. So when I was asked how fast could things turn around, I said, give me a year because if I can work on the inside on our culture, then I had no idea it was gonna take off the way it did. Now I'll tell you that if you do it right, just get out of their way and hang on because things start to go really fast in a positive direction. So did you find that your, your morning dailies played an important role to integrate the practical challenges and issues and hot, hot uh, problems you faced every day with your desire to, to train and teach and develop this transition so that you had the mindset the skill set, the tool set. How did you use those morning briefings for or dailies as a way of combining the two, the practical and the learning and modeling? Well, we also had morning training. Every morning I took the officers off the street half at a time, because that was seemed to be our quiet time, to come in and we would we would train up to 45 minutes every morning. And our topics. And our issues that we developed and trained and, and grew on, many of them came out of these dailies. We were seeing things that we were doing that were wrong. We were not understanding. I'll give an example. Mental health issues at the time were coming at us, and we were putting mentally uh, challenged, uh, ill people in jail because we had no other. We had no other partnerships. We had no other way to deal with it. We started to recognize, hey, there's people out there that actually. Would rather and they were talking to us about don't put them in jail bring them to us so as an example then we we had this uh, the canadian mental health association come to us and uh, provide us alternatives uh, to uh, to jail for our officers to take to instead of um uh you know the at our detachment and um that's just an example of all the every day we were looking for new topics and and new areas to Sometimes I even introduced the positive ticket program and what principles that was built on and, and why it's so important to build that positive relationship with youth. So that was a big part of the daily. But I, I think if you, you know, if you look back, I mean, Harvard Business Review identified like the number one motivating factor to for uh, employees engagement is just they just want to be able to be able to do their job that they were hired and being paid to do and if you can remove those obstacles and barriers and you don't know that until you ask them and then you figure out what it is and then you start to make adjustments sometimes they're just uh, the micro adjustments right it's you don't have to do huge adjustments that that just day after day you've only got one way to go and over time it's going to get better hmm. you know your your positive ticking initiative with the youth represents a very different approach and paradigm 
from the typical reactive mode of law enforcement. Kind of like in the story you shared in the beginning about being a hunter, catching people doing wrong. Could you talk about the difference between the law enforcement paradigm and that which you came to embrace and model? Oh yeah, that this this the whole initiative won't go away. It's still, I still get calls and emails every day. That's the the website positiveTickets.com just to share how we did it and how you can do it because uh, I just didn't have the capacity to keep answering the same questions. Mm. It really happened at one of the dailies or a few of the dailies where we were talking. Uh, I was hearing all the statistics coming in about the the criminal youth, the nuisance youth, the all the negative around the youth and. We were labeling that the our youth is criminal and negative and all the all the not supportive language. And of course, what are you going to get more of when you start rolling out that type of, uh, of of thought to action? So it was like, okay, let's shake it up. Let's try something. Let's try a third alternative. Let's catch them for doing things right instead of for doing things wrong. Let's wait in the bushes and hunt for them to catch them wearing their helmet, not smoking not breaking into your house, using a crosswalk, doing their homework. Heck, it was even just when they're uh, in groups hanging around uh, convenience stores, looking like in an evening time on a Friday night, they may not be up to all 100% positive. Let's give them movie tickets and send them to a movie, call their parents and say, we're sending, we're paying, we're sending a movie on us. It's the whole idea about getting my officers out of the car, because the other thing I didn't tell you in my early years is that when I asked the kids to draw a picture of a police officer, they had my head looking through the window of a car. Mm. Yeah, I was the legless Mountie because I needed to get them out and engage. And, and not everybody gets uh, as comfortable dealing with uh, you know young people and teenagers, uh, police officers also. So this was a way to force them. Uh, and it just, uh, it just took off. It was like, oh, I can tell you stories forever, but it was uh, very... It was one of the things that uh, will be a legacy for a long time. So inspiring. Lord Hastings, this whole framework of discussion is right at the heart of what you deal with uh, every day in your responsibility in the House of Lords and Parliament. You're dealing with very similar issues. You've done it your whole life, dealing with crime and the empowerment of youth. Uh, I know you have some questions for Ward. Let me turn some time to you and feel free to run. Well, Ward, good morning and thank you for being with us. Um, let, me, let me just hone in on one thing that seems to come through in what you've said and what you've done so far, which is you're very positively focused on relationships. You're, you're very pro people. Yes. And just what you said there about the image of some of those young boys and girls seeing you as, in fact, just part of a machine, a car, as compared to being a human being. Where did you develop your instinctive human relationship commitment from? I think we all have it. I think systems and structures are set up that we're not, maybe weren't able to, to really roll it out to where we wanted to be. I think there was a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of uh, just a lot of barriers that just didn't allow what we all really want to do. Um, and so it, it was, it was there. It was just probably the fact that I finally was in a position mm. where I had a larger circle of influence. And also I didn't care about getting promoted anymore. It wasn't about uh -huh. my career. And I made that decision when I went to Richmond before that, I wanted to be the, the commissioner. Right. But then I said, no, 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 this is not where I want to be. And so there's a couple things leaders have to do. And, and the, the people will read through you real quickly, whether you're doing it for your career or you're doing it for your, the right reasons for your people, which include your community. And well, in policing, it's about your community first and your mm -hmm. men and women deliver to the community. I mean, that's a very powerful thing that you've, you've said that you you chose not to go up the promotion ladder you chose to prioritize the community you were, you were with and i and i imagine you probably had a lot of people in the system criticizing you for not being on the crawl and you must have had great resilience to deal with that i did because i turned down promotions and i paid a price for that but also i think i 
Uh, I also shook the uh, the branches because we started to move to the third alternative policing, right? We started to say, look, there is, there is a different way, uh, upstream, midstream, and downstream. We started to recognize, because when community policing rolled out, it was all about partnership, which is synergy. We lost that during 9-11. After 9-11, everybody went back to the quick fix and, and enforcement and and really a, a, a two alternative thinking where we were moving towards third alternative before. Uh, I was bringing it back, just recognizing that it, it it's the only way to go, but that that made a lot of people afraid. And thus, that's why we're at today, the defund police. Really, they're, I wonder if they're just asking about third alternative policing. They're mm -hmm. asking about something. They're asking for what we were doing because we recognize we couldn't do it alone and we brought in a lot of partnerships. Mm -hmm. How have you been able to see the continuity of what you founded, what you delivered? How have you got it out into other people's psyche? Relent, you have to be relentless. It has to start at the top, and then you need that senior leadership team to be relentless on the principles, to be relentless on the foundations that you are building, whatever your business, whatever your rollout is. And if you stay relentless on that, then 80, 85% will just jump on board. However, before, during, or after, but most of them move along with you. You let them enjoy the successes. You give them the rewards. You, you are the... I always joked about being the dumbest of a group of smarter, better people around me. I've unleashed them. I, I knew what, because leadership's about letting go, but you got to be careful of what you let go and when you let go and how much you let go, because obviously it can come back to bite you. But that, that whole idea of just unleashing that talent after they get a taste of what it could look like. But more importantly, it was the community that came to us saying, we want more and more and more of this. And, you know, even positive tickets, the officers would come to me and say, you know, when I used to drive up to, to groups of youth in the school and stuff, the kids would run away from us. Now they run to us. They truly always were telling me, like, I'm just getting swarmed by kids. All they want is positive tickets. They want to talk to me. They, I, I can't do my job anymore. And I'd laugh and I'd go, but that is your job. So, so you, you're, you're hinting at something very powerful here, which is the inner psychology of all of us that we all want to. We long to be respected and treasured, known, understood, received. Right. Very powerful. Uh, and the traditional policing model doesn't, doesn't focus on that, but you focused on a very different approach. And um, that must come from deep within you, likewise? I, I think it can come from within you, but it's there. It's there today. The problems you guys were seeing today are very fixable. This is, this is not rocket science. It can be done. It can be done very quickly. It's not going to change overnight, but it, the, the, and the, the initiative to start is the only thing stopping is, is, is us right now. And it's about reframing. It's about, it's, it's about a whole new, it's about the third alternative. It's about a new way. It's about coming together synergistically and in partnerships. But before we do that, we really need to seek to understand. We really need to listen. We got to get that talking stick out there and let that venting occur because yeah. things have changed with, uh, I didn't have social media the way they, the police have it today. The mm. prejudgment that occurs today on 140 characters or 280 now with Twitter and people not having the patience perhaps that they did before where they were waiting for inquiries and, and courts and trials to give decisions. Now you can make your decision in one small little video clip or a little tweet. Uh, it, it, the world has changed, but we have to also re-imagine and then re-deliver in, in the new world uh, in policing, for example. But I hear defund the police and I go, oh yeah, that's, that's not, they're not asking to defund the police. They're asking for upstream, midstream, and downstream whole wraparound services to deal with hard on crime, soft on crime, and in the middle, everything, right? That's what they're, what's what, and, and past just crime. I mean, the metrics are all on, on your side. There's no doubt about that. The, the savings involved, the, the reduced offending, the better outcomes, they're all on the side of the approach that you've taken. But when you see things like Minneapolis, or you see even some of the tensions you've probably witnessed here in the UK and Bristol this last week, or even the approach that the London police have taken to young black offenders, uh, and it causes so much tension. Right. Um, how, how, just, how do you feel we, we can really teach, take the strength of what you've been doing 
and get that through to what seems to be quite intransigent systems? Well, there's a lot of pain. And I don't think we've even acknowledged the pain, let alone let that pain be truly understood. And then ask the question after, after the, 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 if I could call it psychological error, after the venting has, has finally finished to a point where we can say, now what can we do together? What different ways can we approach this? What would make a meaningful difference? And, and so there's a lot of pain. And I think the police are at the flashpoint of a lot of deeper pain. I don't think it's just the police. I don't know the metrics on if things are worse from when I was uh, involved in policing to today, but definitely the way it's presented is through social media and, yeah. and, and media generally. But uh, it goes back to the same problem we dealt with after 9-11 where anyone from a Middle Eastern country was seen as a terrorist. Uh, we had to get together in all our different groups. And I had a chief's uh, cultural committee group where I brought all the leaders from all the different groups. And then we came up with uh, final solutions, but I had to listen first. I had to, to use the talking stick is a nice way of putting it. You've emphasized the talking stick a, a lot. And um, Canada has, uh, the talking stick relates very strongly to indigenous communities, of course, right. uh, as well. Have you seen other ways that this approach has been taken on to other aspects of national life? Uh, I've seen it. I've experienced it uh, through my visits in different countries. And uh, simply put, it's amazing when after you know who you are and when you reach out to other people and then you truly want to understand what comes it, it, it's about having the courage again i just love that ask the questions or show up and just put duct tape over your mouth don't try to prescribe just listen truly listen to the so the other side fully understands you finally get it and then you can start to move forward and it's not going to happen overnight i don't want to be airy fairy on these kind of issues it's not there's no quick fix to the problems we've worked ourselves into today but we need somebody to be the chief of hope and we need to deliver on, on action and it's doable. It truly is, but it takes all of us to come together after we finally beat ourselves up and vented enough and said, okay, and, and feel hopeless. Now it's like, okay, what can we do? And there are a lot of things we can do and a few successes and wins and you know, we'll start to build the, those deposits back to that emotional bank account and start to build some trust because that's what it's all about in essence at the end of the day, isn't it? For all leaders, if you don't have trust, yeah, good luck trying to move forward. Well, you've shown such tremendous trust, building people's confidence and their positive approach to policing. Um, I'm going to hand back to Professor Craig in a minute, but I just enter this encouraging additional story for you to hear as well, which is a small Dutch town decided two years ago to take out all the traffic controls, all the crossing controls and all the signs and let people act on their humanity. And what happened as a result was they had fewer accidents, safer streets and a better community and people felt less controlled. And so when we allow people to rise to the best of themselves, yeah. sometimes we see the best becoming the norm. And that's what you've clearly done. So thank you so much. And I'm going to show you the talking stick, which <laughs> Professor Craig gave me as well. So I've got my talking stick, but I'm going to hand back to him as we wrap up now. Thank you so much, Ward, for being part of our conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Hastings. Such insightful questions. Ward, uh, these students that are our prime focus, the future of our world, have seen modeled in many of the leaders that have been brought into this principal leader series, the power and focus of these leaders in building relationships with others, the significance of relationships in the home, in the family, with friends and prioritizing that. And also the, the track record of building strong binding relationships in their team and also out in the broader stakeholder group and communities that they serve in. You are a tremendous model of this. And I wonder if you have every, anything to say about what you learned from your efforts to reach out into your community, to build personally build strong relationships, including with people that may have been viewed as your adversaries and why that's important. 
Sure. Um, well, my message would be that uh, everybody matters. Everybody brings, brings a very special, unique perspective uh, and ideas to the problem and ultimately the solution. And it's yours to reach out to and to, to, to find out from your team. Um, and as a leader, uh, see yourself as uh, first of equals. I used to call myself the detachment enabler because my job was to enable. Uh, and I, I truly believe that um, even though sometimes you may not be able to run with some of the ideas that are presented to you, that, that fully listening to that and then putting it into the, the larger mix is critically important. It's all about relationships. We know that. Nobody wants to work with an I person. They want to be part of we. They want to be that, that they, and they need to be recognized. And then I think finally, higher math. I think it's time we start giving um, credit to our team in a different way than the traditional statistical way we do. And, you know, we looked at that in the end of crime where we were not getting the credit for the prevention and the partnerships and working with all these other agencies where they're all fighting for the dollars. We have to start thinking about higher math and just an, a new way of recognizing uh, and a new way of, of, of funding and so for the leaders, for you leaders, uh, my, my message really comes down to, uh, uh, yeah, you're first of equals and don't ever let yourself think that you're any smarter, any better. Actually, if you flip it around, inverse that pyramid and just consider yourself like the, the non-smartest person of a group of smarter people, man, you're going to um, find some huge wins and successes and uh, both personally and professionally. Hmm. Ward, your time with us, you've been very generous and your time has been a gift to us and to our students that we so admire and are dedicated to. So thank you. Never in our history has your model been more important than today in what the world faces. So thank you for all you've done. And I'm convinced your most important work and contribution is yet ahead of you. So thank you, my friend. It's been a great pleasure to have all of you with us today in the World's Principal Leaders series. On behalf of Lord Hastings and myself, it's been a pleasure to be with you and look forward to seeing you with us next time.